All right. Once again, continuing in the series on going through the characteristics of God. This morning, we covered the characteristic of God being holy. And it, I don't know if you noticed this or picked it up in verse number seven as we were reading. I'm going to jump down to verse number seven. We're going to see that attribute of holy. We're going to see the one we're going to talk about tonight. It says in verse seven, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. So this evening, the characteristic we're talking about is the truth of God, how God is true and, and how important that is that, that God just characterizes truth. And that, and that, you know, when we think of God or when we go to God, when we look to God, we can expect to find nothing other than the truth, the, the, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help us God. He has all of the truth for us. So. Um, that is, that is a, a, actually a great, just a great attribute of our God that, and, and you think about it, I say of our God, of the God, of the one true living God. But when you think about it, you know, there are, there are other gods that people have made up. And when you, when you, if you've heard or read anything about them, there are some deceptive gods out there. There's gods that are like into being full of guile and deceiving and stuff, but that's not who God is at all. There is no other God but the one true God. And God is truth. He provides truth for us. He is true. I'm going to read you some verses um, from Deuteronomy and Isaiah. Stay in Revelation because we're going to turn over to... Um, we're going to look at a few verses in Revelation. You could flip over real quick to Revelation 6 while I read some of these passages to you. Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse number 3, the Bible reads, Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. So the Bible says in Deuteronomy 32 that he's a God of truth. And in Isaiah 65, it basically says the same thing. In verse 16, the Bible reads, That he who blesseth himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. And he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten, because they are hid from mine eyes. 1 John chapter 5, verse number 20, the Bible reads, And we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. By referring to God as him that is true. And we are in him that is true, even in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Anyone interested in finding and knowing the truth will come to no other answer than leading directly to God. Amen. And, and that is one of the great things that, that I love about God having a characteristic just of the truth and that there is no lie of, of the Father, of God. The Bible says that um, Satan is the father of all lies and that there is no truth in him because he's a liar and the father of it. But God is truth and anybody who is, who is genuinely seeking to find God will find the answer that they're looking for. Now, They'll find the answer. They'll find the truth. Whether they accept it or not is up to them. Some people come to the truth and reject it and, and, and refuse it and don't want to know it. I, this is one of those things. I really, really love the truth and, and, and something that I've always wanted. That's why the church I started in Arizona is called Word of Truth is because in that same spirit, I think, is here as well. I've always cared more, or not always, at least always in, from the time that I, I started seeking God. I just wanted to know what's the truth. What's true? What's right? Way back before I was saved, when I was younger, and I wanted to know, and I was trying to figure things out in this life, I was brought up in a, in a Christian home, but I never really put a whole lot of thought into my faith. It was just, it, it was what it was, wasn't saved. It wasn't until I was 19, 20 years old when I decided to start looking and seeking the truth. And just I was just had the, the idea or the mindset of, I just want to know what's right. I want to know what the truth is. 
Now, if that happens to be in Islam, if that happens to be in Buddhism, if that happens to be wherever, in atheism. Now, I didn't believe in atheism because I thought that that was a pretty foolish thing. It seemed evident to me that there was a God. A God existed. There's too much around. You know, the, the creation shows us that there's a creator. That's pretty self-evident. That's, that's really low-level basic stuff. And I didn't have a problem with that at all. But it made sense to me that if there's a creator, that, the, that he would want us to know about him. So that began my search and my journey. But, you know, the point is, I had an interest in just knowing what's right, just what's the truth. It doesn't matter how pleasant it may be or unpleasant or, you know, just want to know what the truth is. And we ought to have that same desire just in our life in general. Obviously, it starts with just finding God. Who is the true God? Who is he? He's the God of the Bible. It's the Lord. That is God. That is who God is. And that is the truth. But in our lives, we ought to have a high esteem and a high value for knowing what the truth is. And we can find the truth. We get all the answers in God's word. But we need to come seeking the truth regardless of what the ramifications might be. It is what it is. You can't say something like, well, I don't like hell, so I'm not going to believe it. Therefore, well, that doesn't change the reality of it. That doesn't change that it's a fact. It doesn't change that it's true. People don't like the God of the Bible, so I'm just going to choose not to believe in that God. Well, it doesn't change that he's God. It doesn't change the truth of the matter. It doesn't change the facts. We ought to be truth seekers in the sense of just what is true versus everything else that's false. I want to know what's right and what's true because that's the only way that you're going to be able to move forward is be able to move forward in truth. Anything else is going to be lateral, backwards, whatever. We want to move forward towards the truth and be able to, to improve upon ourselves and upon those around us. Truth is a, is a very important virtue to have and one that God embodies. So I had to turn to Revelation chapter 6, look at verse number 10. The Bible reads, and, went, and they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Flip over to Revelation chapter 19. I want to show you something here real quick. The characteristics that I've been bringing up in these sermons and teaching on have all been very solid characteristics. I'm not, I'm, I'm trying to find the, the, the biggest ones, right? The, 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 not like the smaller, oh, it's only mentioned a couple times in the scripture, right? But it may still be there. I'm looking for the main characteristics of God to be teaching on. And that's why a lot of the ones I've been teaching on, it'll talk about like God's name, like God's name is jealous and God is, a, you know, it, it, the Bible uses a language of just kind of typifying who God is by that characteristic, by that attribute. And this is no different of being true. And uh, in Revelation chapter 19, look at verse number 11, the Bible reads, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And this is talking about Jesus Christ. It says his name is faithful and true. So true is part of his name that's ascribed to him in Revelation chapter 19. And just as a little bit of a side note on this, turn over to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21, because this is a great truth in Scripture. Revelation 21, verse 5, the Bible reads, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. So the name in Revelation 19 of him that sat upon the horse of Jesus Christ, who is coming then to set up his kingdom, he is called faithful and true. His name is faithful and true. And then he says, right, for these words are true and faithful. And then in Revelation 22, 6, the Bible says, and he said unto me, these sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. And the reason why I'm pointing this out is because Jesus Christ is the word 
made flesh. He is the word of God. So when he says these words are faithful and true, these sayings are faithful and true, and then Jesus is faithful and true because the word of God, Jesus Christ is the embodiment of the word of God. So just as much as Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he embodies the truth. He says, I am the truth. Well, the word of God is the truth. The Bible is the truth in totality. That is the truth. And Jesus embodies the word of God. In John uh, chapter 1, of course, the Bible says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then in verse number 14, the Bible says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Right. So the word who has preexisted, has always been in existence, was with God, was God, right? Part of the triune God that we believe in, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The Word was with God, the Word was God. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We covered grace, and now we're covering the attribute of truth. He's full of grace and truth, the Word of God. Jesus Christ being true, God the Father being true, the Holy Spirit being true. We're going to get into that in a little bit, too. The, just, just as much as we see, we've seen in the, in the other attributes, the, the Trinity outlined as, as all having the same characteristics. Actually, let's just look at that right now. I'll jump a little bit ahead in my notes here. Uh, John, turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, I already quoted the verse in verse 6, the famous verse where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Of course, we see that the truth, Jesus Christ calling himself the truth, I am the truth. And then in verse number 16, the Bible says, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth. So the Holy Spirit is being referred to here as the spirit of truth. Jesus Christ is the truth, the Spirit, you have the Spirit of truth, and of course, the Father is, uh, is a Father of truth. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. And there's, there's other references to the Spirit of truth. Another one's in 1 John chapter 5, verse number 6. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. And then in 2 John chapter 1, verse 2, the Bible reads, For the truth's sake which dwelleth in us, and shall be with us forever. The truth will be with us forever. This, is, this typifies God. Now, why is the truth so important? Well, obviously because why, who would want to follow a lie? Or you want to know what's right and what's true. And one of the great attributes of God, because he's truth, that means that he can't lie. If God was capable of lying, then you, you can't say, well, God is truth. Because the two are just completely polar opposites of one another, and you just cannot have both combined together. As soon as you mix in a lie, just like with salvation, salvation is completely by grace. And as soon as you add just a little bit of work to that, it just works. You can't call it anything else. You can't call it grace at all. It's just, it just becomes work. No matter how much works is in there, it just all works. It's the same thing with truth and a lie. As soon as you just add that little lie, it's just a lie. And that's proven over and over again in Scripture, by the way, too, because when Jesus said that Satan is a father, that there is no truth in Satan, but then we see that he's like quoting Bible and trying, you know, he's saying some things that if you just took one short little segment would be true or factual in and of itself. But he's saying there's no truth in him at all. Because he's always adding and perverting and twisting and changing it, even if it's just a little bit, just a little subtle, but it's enough to just say, well, it's not true. It's a lie. It, it's all that's needed, and the whole thing just becomes a lie. 
another reason why it's important, you know, the Bible teaches that we're born of incorruptible seed. It's not because as soon as you corrupt it, you know, little leaven leaven at the whole lump. We are born of incorruptible seed of, of purity and truth. The Bible says very famous passage. Many of you use this out soul winning in Titus 1, 2 of, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So praise God for God being a God of truth that we can go to and trust. That is a God that you can actually just trust. That if God says something, we, we could have zero doubt whatsoever because he's truth. Because everything that he says, if he, if he makes a prophecy, it's going to come to pass. If he tells you something's right or something else is wrong, then that's the truth. It, it, it's, it's not going to change and God doesn't change. God is true and faithful. We can rely on him. We can trust him because he's true. He'll never fail us. Not one time. And that provides a lot of comfort knowing that. Now, the other thing about lying is that God cannot lie. He also hates lying. Right? He despises lying. It's written in the Ten Commandments. He says that we're not to bear a false witness. And this would be another one of those attributes of God that he expects to be reflected in us that we ought to be true. We ought to be faithful. We ought to be able to make our word mean something. The great thing about a God who's providing truth to us, well, if he's giving us his word and he doesn't lie, his word has to be preserved incorruptible in order for it to be truth. Because if, if it's corrupted, if it's twisted, if it's changed, if it's not really what God said, then it's not truth. We have to have his words available for us today in order for God to even remain true. Since he's promised us that. He's promised that the words were not going to um, ever go away from, from, from this generation, even forever. That... The words will never fail and that he'll always be be there to guide us and to give us instruction and that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So how can we do that if we don't have the words of God? In Proverbs chapter six, the Bible tells us how much God hates lying. Proverbs six sixteen: these six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Abomination is strong language. It's, it's a strong, utter hatred. Uh, it says, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. That's why the Bible says six things that the Lord hates, seven are an abomination unto him. It lists seven things. Lying's mentioned twice. Two times. And just as much as God is true and God gives us the truth and God gives us, God goes through efforts to make sure that his word is preserved and that we can have his word. And when God makes a promise, he is sure to make sure it comes to pass and that we can rely on him as being faithful. So if God says you have eternal life, you have no reason to doubt about that. On the flip side, what we should be able to do, we should have our word matter as well. That's why in God's commandments, he tells us that when you vow a vow, defer not to pay it. When you say something, when you make a statement, when you make a claim, hey, that ought to mean something to you. Don't be one of these people that just rattles off the mouth and your words don't really mean anything. We have a God whose words, every single word that comes out of God's mouth matters and is true and is right and can never fail. It's never contradictory. Look, we're not perfect, but we really ought to do a much better job of making sure that the words that we speak can be relied on, can be viewed as faithful, can be true. That if someone were to come to us and say, well, I heard you say this and I heard you say that, you ought to be able to stand by that. And that means you have to be very careful with the words that you say and how many words you say. The Bible says that a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. Where, uh, in a multitude of words, there lacketh not, there wanteth not sin. It's real easy to start saying things that are not true. 
and just start repeating things that aren't true, even if you don't know, but you're just, well, this is what I heard, and you start repeating things. That's not how God is. God doesn't just repeat things. Of course, God is the source of all truth and wisdom and knowledge, but we need to be careful. If we're going to try to be true and faithful as Jesus is true and faithful, that we are very careful with our words and we treat our words uh, with respect. You know, there used to be, not even that long ago, a generation of people when you made an agreement, right? It was on your word. And you could have a handshake. You could tell someone you're good for something. It would be on your word. And people had respect to that because in general, the society had much more respect to what you said and who, because who you are is tied in to your word. Just as much, I mean, think about how much Jesus Christ is tied into being the word, the word of God. We ought to have that same level of respect and recognition when someone says something. But these days, because people are so, just so easy to lie, it's like now you've got all these big contracts and you got to sign all this stuff. Now, when you sign, it's still, I mean, it's still basically your word that you're signing on there too. When you, when you enter into an agreement and a contract with someone, you know, you're signing this off. But now they need that physical proof because people become so much liars. Oh, no, I didn't agree to that. You know, it's like, well, now we've got to have this. Instead of having the integrity of just being able to say, yes, sir, nope, that, you know, I'm good for that. And, and you can hold me to that. And you will not allow that to fail because your word is on the line. Your character is on the line. Very important attribute, being true. Flip over to um, go over Second Thessalonians chapter number two. I've got a few more verses I want to go through here real quick. Just in how the how the truth extends God's personality. Uh, Psalm 115, verse number one, the Bible reads, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. So God's name is tied in with his, with his truth, with him being true. And in Psalm 119, verse 142, of course, Psalm 119 is all about God's law. It's about the law of the Lord. Just every single verse is referring to the testimonies of God, the commandments of God, the statutes of God, the law of God. Psalm 119, verse 142 says, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. It's the truth. There, you're going to find no lies in here. There's nothing bad. There's nothing deceitful. There's nothing wrong with the law of God. And again, we live in a culture and a society in a dark, wicked place where people want to look at the law of God and judge God's law as if there are parts that are just, oh, that's, that's despicable. Oh, that's not right. Oh, how could you do that? It's truth. It's right. Truth is an important value. In Proverbs 23, 23, the Bible reads, Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. We ought to have a high regard and a high value and treat truth as being precious so much that we're willing to spend for it. We're willing to buy just to, to get the truth, to obtain the truth. We'll, we'll do whatever it takes. Okay, if, we need, if I need to spend some money on this or, get, or, or make some sacrifices to, to obtain the truth, to get the truth, then I'm going to do it. But then it says, and sell it not. Because you love the truth, I'll go through whatever I need to in order to get it, but I'm going to share it freely. I'm going to give it away for free. Any truth that I come across, I may have to spend money and time and investment and studying and trying to find out the truth. But as soon as I know it, man, I'm going to give it away for free. And that's how God wants the truth being propagated. Hold it in high regard, high value. Don't just ignore it and brush it aside. And oh man, you know, kids, it's, it's Bible time. Look, value the Bible time. You're getting a dose of truth. I don't know what's like in your family. My family, we read the Bible to our kids every day. 
Every single day we sit them down and they have to listen to the Bible. And I understand not all kids just enjoy it, but we as parents need to teach them and instruct them and just help them along and let them know this is the truth. You're not going to find this pure truth out in the world. It's not there. This, just listen up and let these words sink in. Even if you don't completely understand them all right now, receive the truth from God's word. It will help you. It's designed to help you. We don't, we don't gather you up to torture you for this show. It's not, this isn't a pleasure that parents get of torturing children by just making them listen to the Bible. No, it's good for you. And we shouldn't ever look on it that way either as, as some drudgery of, of Bible time. You know, parents, make, make it fun for your kids. Do some, fathers, do some teaching when you read the Bible. Make it interesting. Make sure they're understanding what they're hearing. Buy the truth, sell it not. And that's also, by the way, a big downfall in many churches is when they start selling the truth. When they start, they, they start opening up their bookstores and they've got all the word of God out there and they start selling, selling it for money. The right, yeah. Bible says buy the truth and sell it not. Yeah, right. That's why what we're going to do, we're going to go out, we'll buy these Bibles and then we're going to offer them up for free. For anyone who, who wants, anyone's looking for the truth, hey, we'll put the truth right in your hand and we won't charge you a nickel for it. It's free. Take it. We'll go out and spend the money on it. But it's free for your, all the resources, anything. We're, you're, if you're promoting truth, you know, don't go charging people for it. And especially in a, in, in a place that's supposed to be the house of God. That is wickedness, and that's why Jesus overturned the temple, overturned the tables of the money changers. Why? Because the money changers, they're taking money and receiving money, and they were selling stuff there. It's not that they were ripping people off, they were just selling stuff. It doesn't matter how much they were charging for it. That was something that's not supposed to be being done in the house of God. But that's another subject. I had you turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, of course. This is a shorter sermon tonight, but... Um, I'm going to close on this. Of course, salvation just relies on the truth, on knowing the truth, on receiving the truth. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We have to receive the truth from God's word in order to be saved. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 kind of spells this out a little bit better. Look at verse number 10. Bible reads, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. You're saying the people that perish, the people that die and go to hell, they didn't receive the love of the truth. Verse 12, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And it's contrasting there. Just receiving the truth with forsaking the truth and just going off and having pleasure in unrighteousness. Why? Because the truth is going to tell you what's right and what's wrong. So people prefer to have unrighteousness. I don't want to know what's right, so I'm going to go just have, just enjoy not being right, not receiving the truth, not receiving the right way, and just go that way instead. Whatever that may be. The, the, the people who don't believe the truth, they enjoy their unrighteousness of whatever their false God is or their false way to heaven or anything. That's, that's what they're going to enjoy, their unrighteousness. It's the wrong way, unright. Verse number 13, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. You believe the truth. People who believe a lie are going to go to hell. People who believe the truth are going to go to heaven. It's that simple. It really is that simple when you break it down. James 1.18 says, Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. We're born again by the word of truth. It's God's word is the word of truth. 
And that, that incorruptible seed is what brings us our life. Of his own will begat, us, begat, begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And anyone who is against the truth is against God. Second Timothy, turn there. It's the last place I'll have you turn. Like I said, it's a shorter sermon tonight. Second Timothy chapter 3. It's the last passage we're going to turn to tonight. There is a battle that we're engaged in of thoughts, ideas, you know, with our words. And, and ultimately, it's, it's, it's truth and error, truth and lies. And there are a lot of lies out there because anything that's not of the truth is a lie. Anything, you, you know, there's a lot of ways you can pervert and change the truth and mix it into a lie, but there's only one truth. There's only one right way, just like there's many paths that lead unto hell and the destruction, right? But there's only one way into heaven. There's one right way. It's the same thing, same exact concept. There's one right way. There's one truth. Everything else is a lie. There's many lies. We need to be careful with what we say. One, you want to have credibility with people. You, you need to be credible that when you speak, you're not known to speaking falsehoods, known for speaking error, that you take your word seriously so people, when they hear what you say, can say, oh, brother so-and-so said this. I'll listen up. I'll pay attention. He's been proven time and time and time again to be right. That holds value. That holds weight when people can look to what you're saying and say, yeah, you know what? It just seems to come to pass. It seems to, to be the, the truth every time. They're going to value your, your judgment and your, appear and, um, your appearance, your um, advice, your counsel. I had to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse number 7, because there's those that are opposed to the truth, those who don't want to know the truth and will, in fact, push and propagate lies and, and literally desire to deceive people into obeying and following the wrong way. It's 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 7, the Bible reads, Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, as Jannes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. So this passage is talking about people who are reprobate. And let's go up a little bit further in the passage and get better context. This is the last passage we're reading anyways tonight. Let's go all the way back up to verse number one, because this is ultimately who we're at battle with, who we're, who we're in a spiritual war engaged with. Look at verse number one. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minders, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such, turn away, turn away from these people, these wicked reprobates. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. They go and lead these people away, not with the truth, with the error, with the appeal of sin and with the desire of these lusts. Instead of showing them the truth and go, no, that's wrong. That's the wrong way. That leads to destruction. They're just leading him with the lies. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why? Because these people have already been given up on. Now, as Janus and Jabbers withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. There are those that promote truth and those that oppose the truth. Easy to pick a side, but we need to be careful that, especially in your zeal to, you know, achieve a greater good, and, and be careful about this. 
You say, but what I want to teach is a truth. How you do it is just as important as the truth you're teaching. The means do not justify the ends, is what I'm saying. Some people say, oh, the means, you know, the, the or excuse me, the ends justify the means. The ends do not justify the means. So the end result does not justify how you get to the end, is what, is what that means. When we're teaching the truth to someone, you're trying to lead someone to Christ, you're trying to show someone some truth from the Bible, don't go adding things that aren't in God's word to try to bolster your position, to try to prove why what you're saying is right. Let God's word be the truth and point people to that and use it appropriately. I don't care if you're right on what the final doctrine is. Be very diligent and careful in how you're supporting that because if it comes out, if you, if you come across as being deceitful and using the word of God deceitfully, you're going to lose any credibility you have with that person and you're going to completely destroy what, the good work you're trying to do by bringing them to that point. And that's not the way God wants you. Look, if something's true, there's going to be plenty of evidence anyways. You don't need to go padding your, your case and trying to build it up even bigger than it is. It's, it's like the, the, you know, the, the cops that want to... Um, they know someone's guilty of something or they know someone committed a crime, but they don't really have a whole lot of evidence. So they go and plant evidence on them and they'll think that, well, you know, the ends justify the means. We know he did it, but we just don't have enough proof here. So they just have to go and, and just just fabricate it and add it. Don't go doing that. That's wicked. That's wrong. We can't be deceitful no matter no matter what it is that you're talking about. It's not as, you know, do things the right way. God wants you to do things the right way. God spells out in his, in his word many times, in his commandments, how he wants us to do things. And he says, that's why he says, you know, to obey is better than sacrifice. He doesn't care if you, if you end up bringing this huge sacrifice. It's kind of like, you know, do you think God's going to care about this huge sacrifice if you have to go and steal it from someone else to go and sacrifice it unto God? No. He doesn't want you stealing. Right? He's saying, but I don't have anything really else to offer. Well, just offer what you have and God will be happy with that. But don't go... And, and, and break his law and do things that are deceitful and do things that are dishonest and untrue just to, to try to hit this other, this end. So thank God for the truth that, thank God that we can't, we could go to him and have zero doubt. And we could read his word and know 100% because God is true, nothing in this book is a lie. You can take every single thing, you know, let God be true, but every man a liar. You're going to hear a lot of people contradicting and, and trying to tell you why the Bible's wrong and why the Bible's stupid and how it's not factual. You know what? God's true. That person that's telling you that is just repeating what he heard from some other man who's repeating what he heard from some other man who's repeating what he heard from some other man. And I don't care how many books you've read because every other book than the Bible is just written by some man anyways. You know, people want to exalt themselves and lift up their pride and say, oh, I'm so well read and I've read this and I've read that. They're still reading man. I'm not against reading books, but here's the thing. At the end of the day, you know, all of your knowledge and all of your sources, you're still coming sourced from men. Let's go to the truth, the unadulterated truth that comes from God. We have his word and we don't have to doubt at all. Any other book you read from any other man, how do you know if what they're saying is right and true? You don't. Every book. And that's the funny thing about, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be science books, right? How did the professor get to the point where he's at? How did the scientist get to where he's at? They're reading books and studies from other people. Do they really know that those things are true? Or do they have to take it on some level of faith? Everything that you read has to be taken on some level of faith. How much do you trust? How much are you going to believe? Oh, yeah, but I'm reading about all their experiments. Well, did they really do that experiment? Were you there? Did you see it? You have to have some level of faith that they actually did these things. Now, obviously, granted, there's some times where you can say, well, I've done the experiments and this matches up with that and you're, and you're, you're giving credibility to it, but you still have have to have a level of faith in everything that you receive. I don't care what it is that you're reading. 
Yet man's wisdom wants to exalt the wisdom of this world so far up above the book because you're just believing some book. So are you. <laughs> you're, you're reading what some so-called expert thinks and you're going to put all of your faith in those experts because you just think that man is infallible. Instead of going to the real truth, the Word of God, to get all of our answers, and they're here, and they're... Be why? Because it came from God. Because God is truth. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for being true, for who you are, and, and that it's impossible for you to lie, because otherwise then you couldn't be true. Just like it's impossible for you to be unclean, otherwise you can't be holy. There, there's so many things... Lord, that, that are just, just great about you. We thank you for creating us and, and bringing us here, Lord. We ask you to um, help us with our mouth, with our conversation, with the things that we say, that we would treat our words seriously, uh, just as you've treated your word seriously, Lord. Help us to keep our tongues under control and that we would only be saying those things that are true and, and not be spreading falsehoods and lies, dear Lord. Please help us with this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.